interring to them especially for taking up the research activities and uh, question uh, color image processing or computer vision and that to basically using the deep learning network is something that i am focusing at so okay. we are on deep learnings uh, making the deep learning giving some of the application for this image processing is the major area that we are focusing right now i have not worked on uh, deep learning okay uh, my approach has been the uh, the typical approach of uh, segmentation and uh, feature extraction and pattern classification through machine oh. learning uh, oh. so that's been the primary approach in most of my projects uh, let's see we will we'll go through this program and then if uh, there are opportunities for further interaction i'll be happy to do so definitely the only thing that i also worked earlier prior to moving into deep learning uh, with what you just said is the conventional spatial and transformed one processing but moment i into this uh, deep learning i found that uh, much of our earlier experiences of working with this uh, parallel processing and all those things that is not very much needed because the deep learning will take into account many of your experiences of past to get your machine trained and once the machine is trained Uh, possibly the kind of the test images, kind of the similar other images, getting appropriately tested on this becomes very easy. It doesn't really need to go much into the algorithmic approach of designing of the developments. So that is what I'm more attracted to this deep learning. That's correct. That's the advantage. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's the advantage. Anyway, sir, we'll have a better interaction once I listen to you today. and uh, once we get connected after this uh, interaction uh, of the today's meeting we'll be definitely taking it forward uh, yes hmm? thank you thank you yeah thank you a lot thank you is the time for you to deliver the speech yes thank you thank you very much thanks a lot you're welcome yeah. hello good yeah. morning vikram patil sir good morning hello? yes Good morning. Uh, Hope I am audible. Yes, yes, sir. Ranga and sir, we are having with us our director, Dr. Vikram Patil, sir. I don't see the video. Uh, is his video on? Yes, yes, yes sir. Yes. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. thank you for good organizing morning. the conference for inviting very very good morning to all the adct faculty they are the one who are the pioneer in taking up this activity forward so that they are the instrumental in making this research to go forward in a big direction i think we must support them we are always with them and will support them con will continue giving support to this adct people good part sir please go yes, ahead yes sir your, your motivation will always yeah. make yeah. us uh, feel to do something and contribute something you will be doing many things under your guidance sir uh, no i will thank you okay registration group dr sapate yes yes madam shall we uh, uh, shall go ahead yes 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 sir yeah we have to switch on the recording now yes uh, dr sapate i had asked uh, dr bandari if one of you could please keep your video on i would like okay. to make sure i would like to keep that window on so that i know the link is working okay okay sir thank you we'll be with you all the way so good morning one and all uh i dr suhas sapate on behalf of anna saheb dange college of engineering and technology and on behalf of organizing committee of this international conference ic ic triple e 2022 welcome all the dignitaries present in this online uh, meeting so i am very happy here today to introduce the expert for keynote session today and is none other than dr rangraj m rangayan sir is right now professor 
emeritus of electrical and computer engineering university of calgary alberta canada sir received his bachelor of engineering degree in electronics and communication engineering in the year 1976 from the university of mysore at the people's education society college of engineering mandya in karnataka and he received his phd in electrical engineering from indian institute of science bangalore in the year 1980 sir served the university of manitoba in canada and university of calgary in research academic and administrative positions right from 1981 to 2016 his research interests are in digital signal and image processing biomedical signal and image analysis and computer aided diagnosis dr rangaraj rangayan sir has published more than 170 papers in international peer reviewed journals and around 270 papers in proceedings of different conferences according to google scholar dr rangaraj rangayan sir has publications with more than 16800 citations with an h index greater than 60 he has supervised and co-supervised around 27 masters thesis 17 doctoral thesis and more than 50 researchers all over the world at various research levels he has been recognized with the 1997 and 2001 research excellence awards of the department of electrical and computer engineering in the 1997 research award of the faculty of engineering appointment as university professor from 2003 to 2013 at the university of calgary sir has got received many awards and he is the author of two important textbooks which are followed all over the world by the researchers and academicians in the domain of biomedical and signal analysis the title of the book is biomedical signal analysis which is published by ieee and billy publications two editions are there one in the 2002 and the other in 2015 there is another famous book written by sir that is biomedical image analysis by crc press published in the year 2005 sir has co-authored many other several books on image processing and biomedical applications sir is the outstanding engineer medal winner from ieee in the year 2000 13 sir was also elected as fellow of ieee in the year 2001 he is fellow of many uh, other academic and research institutes dr rangayan sir's research has been featured in many newsletters magazines newspapers as well as in several radio and television interviews he has been invited to present lectures in more than 20 countries and has held visiting or honorary professorship with the university of liverpool tampere university of technology finland and many other universities all over the world including india it is my great privilege and honor here to welcome such a great uh, researcher and on behalf of the organizing committee of this conference and on behalf of anna saheb dangi college of engineering i warmly welcome you sir and i request dr rangayan sir to start his session today over to you sir thank you very much for the introduction namaste and good morning to all the attendees of the conference <clears throat> thank you very much dr sapate for the introduction and for inviting me and uh, dr bhandari and the conference organizers i wish you all a very successful conference it's my pleasure to 
present to you this uh, tutorial talk on color image processing with a few applications in the area of uh, biomedical image analysis. Some of the work described is from our lab and some of the other examples given are from other researchers publications. This seminar is a summary of uh, a textbook that I have co-authored with Dr. Begonia Archa and Dr. Carmen Serrano, who are professors with the University of Seville in Spain. This book was published by SPIE. Can you hear me? Can you hear me and see the... Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The PPT file is coming okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. So let's start with uh, an introduction to the nature of color images. First, let us look at what is color. We know that uh, a broadband white light that we get from the sun gets broken up into the colors in the rainbow when we have some moisture, some water in the atmosphere, and we get these beautiful rainbow patterns, which shows that, uh, which shows that uh, white light is made up of uh, a spectrum of colors. And this image shows a double rainbow in the Kananaskis Park, which is close to where I live in Calgary. And at the bottom, you see the spectrum of visible light and colors as seen by most human beings. Violet is around 380 nanometers of wavelength. And then you have blue, green, yellow, orange, red into about 700, 750 nanometers longer wavelength. So this is the visible part of electromagnetic radiation that comes to us from the sun. The radiation that comes from the sun is much broader than the visible portion. In fact, much, much broader. We can perceive only a very small fraction of the bandwidth of light and electromagnetic radiation in general coming from the sun. But this is very important. And through this medium, through light and through our visual system, we acquire a substantial and perhaps a major portion of the information that we get through our life in learning about ourselves and our environment and the topics of our interest. So how do we represent color? There are several representations of color or attributes of color. The main attributes are the following. Hue, the term hue indicates a dominant wavelength or a band of wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum that is predominantly blue or green or yellow or orange or red and so on. Typically, we don't talk about one particular wavelength, but a band of uh, wavelengths around a central dominant wavelength, which we perceive as a dominant color. Saturation indicates the quality of the color in terms of not being diluted with white. That is how pure is the color or colorfulness. So if you, if you have to look at pure red, it is saturated maximum red. Whereas if you look at rose or pink, it is red diluted with white. And then we have intensity or brightness, which is the primary visual sensation that is related to luminance, which is a physical characteristic. Now, wavelength is a physical characteristic, but what we perceive a particular wavelength of light as some color is a sensation that is particular to our visual system. A specific wavelength may appear to be a certain color to me, but a slightly different color to somebody else. 
and some people may not be able to sense certain colors at all. So the perception of color varies from individual to individual. So the interpretation of wavelength as color is subjective, but there are some established regions or parts of the wavelength that we associated with certain specific colors, as I'll show you. There are two other terms called chroma lightness and a few others that uh, are used, but hue, saturation, intensity, or brightness should be adequate for most purposes. How do we perceive color? To begin with, how do we perceive light? Light is sensed by our retina. The retina is at the back of the eyeball, the inner surface at the back, and the retina contains sensors or detectors, if you want to call them so. The sensors are made up of rods that are sensitive to light intensity or brightness information. How bright is the scene? And then there are cones that are of three types that are sensitive primarily to red, green, and blue bands of wavelength. They're not sensitive to one frequency or wavelength, but a band. And since we have three types of cones, that lends to a number of representations that are based on three components and the term trichromacy, three components of color. These are the spectral sensitivity plots for the long, the red one, medium, green one, and short, blue cones. As I said, cones are the sensors or transducers in our retina that are sensitive to these parts of the wavelength. The wavelength shown is from 350 to about 800 nanometers. Shorter wavelengths are blue, longer wavelengths are red, but they overlap. We perceive blue in this band from about 360 to about 500 nanometers. And green and red overlap substantially. But the dominant frequency for green is somewhere here, 500 or so. And the dominant frequency for red is around 600. I should say a wavelength here in nanometers. So this lends to several representations of color images or color spaces. The most common one is red, green, blue, RGB, three colors. Some TV tubes were previously made using three electron guns for the three colors. And even now, RGB uh, representation is used in cameras and in television or display systems. So when you combine red, green, and blue in equal amounts, you get white. That is well known. But if green, blue components are zero, then we have only pure red. And if red and blue are zero, then we have only green and so on. So these are called the primary colors. Or to be more specific, the primary light colors. If you were to consider pigments used in printing, then the primaries are cyan, magenta, yellow. The CMYK system includes black. And if you want, you can write RGBW, including white here. But it is simply quoted as RGB. Whereas CMYK is inclusive of black because you need black for printing. These are also known as the secondary colors, but primaries in terms of pigment. RGB are primaries for light. And then we have hue saturation intensity, which are what I mentioned earlier. So instead of the color components as red, green, blue, cyan, magenta, yellow, here hue is indicated as a certain angle and saturation as the purity of that color and intensity is brightness that is kept separate. So here, hue saturation together represent color, whereas intensity represents only brightness. So this intensity component has no color information. So two components for color, one for just brightness. Whereas RGB, all are color. CMY, they're all color components. 
And then for standardization, the International Standards Institute came up with a number of uh, standards. Two famous ones that are used commonly are LUB and LAB. And these are standards that have been defined and they have some advantages as I'll mention later. And there are formulas to convert between all these representations. If you know a color in any one of these systems or spaces, you can convert that to another space using certain formulas. These are all described in the book I mentioned, so I will not go into such formulas, but instead I'll try to give you a, a pictorial tour of uh, certain aspects of color image representation and processing. And then there are a few others, YIQ here, Y represents the brightness and IQ. This is typically used in TV, YUV. Also, Y is uh, the brightness part, UV represent the color components. And CIE, RGB, the International Committee for Light, RGB standards. And CIE, XYZ, I'll show this in a moment. And a few others. Depending on the application, depending on what you want to do, some of these representations may be more advantageous or more beneficial to work in than the others. When you have an arbitrary color, to represent the arbitrary color, color matching functions have been defined in terms of three functions that are approximately labeled as red, green, blue, but they're not single wavelengths. They are distributions of spectral intensity over wavelength. As I mentioned, blue is short wavelength from 400 to 500 or so here, nanometers. Green is shown here, approximately 500 to uh, about 600 nanometers. And red has a broader bandwidth, including negative components. And this creates a problem because there's no negative light. If there's no light, it is black, it is dark, but there is no notion or concept of negative light component. So this function that has been designed has this portion that is negative and hence lacks physical interpretation. So this was modified into what are called the X, Y, and Z color matching functions, which are similar functions of wavelength, spectral energy, Blue is here, which is called uh, Z. Green is here, which is called Y. And red is here, which is called Z. And the negative part of the red function that you saw here has been modified to be positive here. So these are all positive. So when you have an arbitrary color that you want to represent, you take a projection of that color, which is a spectral distribution of energy. So an arbitrary color has a certain spread of energy over a certain band, let's say from 350 to 800 nanometers, it has some distribution. By taking projections of that distribution, which is like a vector, onto each one of these vectors, you get the components X, Y, Z. Similar to the Fourier transform, where we take projections of a given arbitrary signal onto sinusoidal functions. <laughs> In the case of the Fourier transform, we use many, many infinite number of sinusoids. But here, there are only three basis functions or matching functions. So when you have a color like this uh, magenta, it has so much of X, 0 0.4, and so much of Y, 0 0.25. And this is normalized, so Z is 1 minus X minus Y. That is, X plus Y plus Z is equal to 1, so if you specify two of them, the third one is given by one minus some of the other two. So this contour shown here shows all the pure colors, violet, blue, green, yellow, orange, red, with the nominal uh, wavelength, 400, 480, 520, 580, 600, 700 nanometers. Within this, there's cyan here. Within this, depending on the gamut 
that is the range of operation of the device that you're using, there will be a certain space over which you will have all the colors that are represented or that may be represented using that gamut. Standard RGB, sRGB has a triangular gamut like this. So these are the only colors you can represent using sRGB. These colors here are not representable. So every device, every gamut has a certain range of operation and a certain range where it is not functional. The primary colors, both for light and uh, pigment, RGB and CMY, may be represented as the vertices or the corner points of a cube, the unit cube, RGB are three mutually orthogonal directions in this representation. And you put a box here, each side is equal to one. So one zero zero is red, zero one zero is green, zero zero one is blue. And then zero one one is cyan, RGB, green and blue equal, no red, that is cyan. Yellow is one one zero, magenta is one zero one, that is red and blue and so on. Black is at the origin, no light, and white is at the opposite vertex here. So if you take this line joining black to white, the origin to this corner of the cube, that is the grayscale representation in monochromatic or color colorless images. So if you have just a grayscale image, the values are along this line. Otherwise, there is a cube, a 3D space of all colors here. If you go to the hue saturation index, the representation is different, where the cube you had here is modified or mapped geometrically into a double cone. One cone this way and another cone inverted. Black is here at the bottom, white at the top. If you take a section, it's a circle. And if you go around the rim or the periphery of the circle, you get all the colors, the pure colors, red, yellow, green, cyan, blue, magenta. By convention, red is assigned zero degree, and then yellow, green, cyan is 180 degrees, diametrically opposite to red, and then blue, magenta, back to red. So 360 degrees or two pi radians will give you all these colors. The distance from the center along this axis to the periphery of this circle represents saturation. How pure is the color? If saturation is equal to one, you are on the periphery. If saturation is less than one, then you are inside the circle somewhere here and it is pure green there, but diluted light green here. There's pure red there, but if you come inside, saturation is lower you get pink and rose. And if you come to the center, there's no color, zero saturation. So it is white. So if you go along this vertical axis, you go black to white, various shades of grayscale. If you come outside, you have the colors. So if you take a section, you see all the colors, red at zero degree, Yellow is somewhere here, around uh, 60 degrees. 120 degrees is green. 180 degrees is cyan. 240 degrees is blue. And then 300 is magenta. Back to red. So there is a range of angles for red. All of these look red, but different hues of red. So angle represents hue. As you change the angle, the color changes. In this illustration, hue is varied, but constant saturation. All of these values are of equal saturation, so same color from the center to the periphery of the circle. Intensity is constant. If I change the intensity, the image just becomes darker or brighter. That is, you're going up and down this vertical axis. So here intensity is constant, so it is one circle. If I change the saturation from the center, the saturation is increasing. 
You see in the center saturated is zero, there is no color, it's white or some gray level. As I increase the saturation, I get rose, light pink, dark pink, and then pure red. Similarly, no color, light, green, darker and darker, and then pure green, and blue, and so on. So this is a representation of hue as angle around the circle and saturation as distance from the origin. Intensity is the third dimension, which you don't see here. So here's a color image that was me a few years ago, younger. And this is Dr. Acha and this is Dr. Serrano. And we just wore these red, green, and blue for fun. So you have RGB. And if you take the red component, my shirt has red. It is large in value. The other colors, green and blue, don't have red, so they're almost black. The green component, the green shirt is or top is bright. Red has no green. Blue has no green, so these are almost black. The background is some brown color that has a combination of all red, green, and blue primaries. If you take blue, the brightest part is this, which is not pure blue. And green has some blue, it's not pure green. Red has no blue. So this shows that you can break a given color image into the red and green and blue components. And if you put them together, of course, you get the full color image. When you have a monochromatic image, you know that you can count the number of pixels having each value, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 255. If it is an 8-bit image, and then you make a histogram, how many pixels have 0, how many pixels have 1, 2, 3, and so on, 255. So that histogram represents the variation of brightness or gray level across the scale. It may be normalized. Here it is 0 to 1 normalized instead of 0 to 255. So if you have an 8-bit image and divide by 255, that's what you have here, 0 to 1. But now you have three components, R, G, B. So you need three histograms, one for red. So that tells you uh, there is a large number of pixels here with bright red. And the low, lower values are not having that many pixels. This is number of pixels times 10 to the power of 4. Blue, you see here. Green, you see another histogram. And then for the brightness, without the color information, the line in black. That is what you will have for a grayscale image if you take just the intensity component, that is uh, the average of R plus G plus B. So R plus G plus B divided by three will give you this, but there are other definitions of brightness also. You can also create a histogram in 3D. Here is a color image, and this is the 3D histogram in the RGB CMY cube. Black is there, white is here, R, G, B, C, M, Y. So the yellow pixels are here. The red pixels are there along the red axis. And green and blue. It's not exactly blue. It is sort of cyan. And so on. So you can represent the color distribution in a 3D histogram like this. And you can do no cluster question. analysis. Find all the clusters. And you can do segmentation using this information. That is, you can get the yellow part only, the cyan part only, green only, and so on. But there are other ways of doing it. I'll show you. If you want to represent using hue saturation intensity, intensity is easy, just grayscale, brightness. But hue is an angle going 0 to 360 degrees or 0 to 2 pi. And we saw that 0 is red, 10 degrees is also red, and minus 10 degrees or 350 degrees is also red. Zero all the way down, 180 degrees, 300, 360 degrees. So from about 340 degrees up to about 20 degrees, it is red. All of this is red. So if I normalize and call this zero, and all this going around is one, then zero and one are both red. 
Similarly, 0.1 is red and 0.9 is also red. Almost. Not exactly. So my red shirt here, it's not all pure red. So it has values that are both 0 and 1, maybe 0 0.05 and 0 0.95. All of this is red, but it appears like this because red spans a range across zero from minimum to maximum. Green is there and blue is there. There's no problem there. Saturation. My shirt is pure red, so saturation is high. The green and blue here are not so pure, so the saturation value is not high. The background on the wall is not pure color, so it is low in saturation. Intensity is just brightness. To overcome this problem of discontinuity, you can take sine of hue divided by two. So then you're converting the range of zero to 360 degrees to zero to 180 degrees and zero and 180 degrees and values close to those two angles will all be zero. So by taking the sign of the angle, now sh my shirt looks all black. This black and white mix up is avoided. Sign of hue angle divided by two. So that is what you see here. And green is 120 degrees divided by two is 60 degrees. And this is 240 degrees blue. And that divided by two is 120 degrees. And these two are equal. These two are equal because they are distance from red. Going back here again, the distance of green from red is 120 degrees counterclockwise. The distance from red to blue is 120 degrees counterclockwise. So blue and green are equidistant from red. And that is what you see here. These two are almost equal. If you take distance from green, sine of hue minus 120 degrees divided by two, green is zero. Red and blue are equally far apart from green. So they look similar. So you can take a reference angle and take the hue angle minus that reference angle divided by two and get images like this that show the difference in hue with a continuity given by the sine function without this arbitrary separation around the mark of zero degree. You can create two dimensional histograms using hue and saturation. I'm showing the color and around the rim of this. The origin has no color, zero saturation and saturation increases from zero to one. Red is here. This is my shirt. This is the skin color, I think, sort of brown. This is the background in the wall, this sort of light brown color, this cluster. This is the green top and this is the blue top. So this has no intensity information. So from this, again, you can do some cluster analysis. You can make clusters and then get those pixels out and try to understand what they represent in image understanding. If you modify saturation and hue, you get these. This is the original image. B, this is hue component with maximum saturation. So I'm keeping the original hue. I saturate everything, all colors, maximum saturation equal to one. So this is pure green. This is not pure green. Now this is pure green. This is not pure blue. This is pure blue. Pure red is that. And when this color on the wall is made pure, saturated, fully saturated, you get this color. Here, this is called ISO intensity rendition with original hue and saturation. So these are the original colors, but all pixels have equal intensity. So they're all equally bright. Uh, I don't know what you would want to use this for, but this is called an ISO intensity rendition. Original colors, 
but intensity information has been removed. And this is the intensity information. So if you combine these two, you get the original color image. So these are the roles of hue, saturation, and intensity in representing color. And I believe, and most color researchers also have similar opinions, that perhaps hue, saturation, and intensity representation is the best in order to understand from a human perspective, from a human perception, human visual perception perspective as to how to represent color and what these components mean. It's very difficult for me to say you should use so much red and so much green and so much blue to get this color. I cannot give you that formula. Of course, there are artists who work with paint and they can tell you that. So depending on your experience, you may be able to specify a certain color in terms of its RGB components or CMY components. But hue saturation intensity is more natural, I believe, and is more closely associated with our interpretation of color in our visual system. Not in the retina, but how the brain interprets color. And when you have a color image, you can break it into the color part and the parts that do not have color chromatic versus achromatic or non-chromatic pixels. If the saturation is very low and the intensity is very low, it means it is black. So I put a threshold on saturation and brightness, I get black pixels. If I say saturation should be low and brightness should be high, I get pixels that are almost white. There is a little bit of color, but mostly white. And if I say give me all the pixels with saturation less than some small amount, let's say 0 0.01. I don't care about intensity. I get dark and bright pixels with almost no color. What could be called non-chromatic or achromatic pixels. All the other pixels have some color. When you are interpreting color images, you need to take into account what is being represented in the color. That is, what does the image contain? Color may not always be natural. Color may represent something else. That is, one may be using color coding, like in this electric, uh, in the power lab, in the machines lab, there are some machines here. But we use uh, RGB or uh, red, blue, and black, depending on which part of the world you live in. Three colors are used. One could be black for the three-phase power supply. So these connectors show something. There is color, but what does it mean? It means something different compared to what we have color here in this image, which is natural color, these parrots. Here, this is an image of the fundus of the eye. The red is the natural color of uh, the back of the eye. The yellow or almost white region is the optic disc or the optic nerve head. There could be other deposits like this, hard exudates, uh, microneurisms, sorry, or uh, hemorrhages in red. And there could be some pigment deposits that could be green or black. So there could be some other colors also in retinal fundus images. And there could be toys with color coding to help children learn shapes and colors. And in arts, in theater, colors could be used to imply a certain nature of the character being depicted, or maybe just for beauty and decoration. And color in the case of pathology images like this, histopathology image, color here is not natural color, it is the dye that is applied to the uh, biopsy sample, dye or stain, and multiple stains could be applied, two, three, four stains could be applied, and in combination, they give you some colors. So depending on the type of sample or specimen you have and the type of dyes and stains you use, different colors mean different things. When you have multimodal medical images, like a CT image, MR image, and uh, uh, 
emission images. You could combine them and create images where each pixel has multiple values, like a CT value, an MR value, uh, an emission value from positron emission tomography. So each pixel may have two, three, four, five values if they're all properly mapped geometrically. Then how do you display them? You have to apply some color transformation and this color is not natural. There's no fire in this brain. It looks like fire, but it is some color. You, you may change the color to whatever you like. So in this manner, you may have natural images and images with pseudo color or images with color coding. And we need to be cognizant of that when we analyze these images. Now, how do you acquire color images in the real world? Until some uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, we only had film that was sensitive to light. So you could only get black and white or grayscale images in the camera. And then film was developed for um, to be sensitive to multiple colors. And then we started getting color film. And then we got CCD detector based cameras for digital imaging. And some of the initial detectors were simply one array of CCD elements, charge coupled device elements that were sensitive to light and would, would give you a charge in proportion to the amount of light coming into the cell, the CCD element. And then two dimensional arrays were created. But to get color images, we get, we need three values per pixel. Most cameras have only one array, a two dimensional array of CCD or some light detecting elements that are just sensitive to light. So we have a sensor array, but then a color filter is put on top of it. You can have one detector array and you can put a red filter on top, get the red image, then put a green filter on top and get a green image, then put a blue filter on top and get a blue image and put all three together and get the full color image. But to put three filters like this will take time. And if you want to acquire images fast, like in your digital camera, you need a different strategy. And for that, a mosaic is used that I'll show you. Then we need dark current correction to remove noise. CCD devices have some current or some charge in them, even when the camera is closed because of thermal agitation of the electrons. So when you open the camera, there is some signal anyway, even before the image is captured. And that gets added as noise because it is random background activity. And then you need to look into what is white balance? What is pure white? Depending on the light that is used, that is shown upon your scene, different colors may appear to be different. If you use a flash, you get certain colors. If you use sunlight, you get certain colors. If you use uh, incandescent lighting, you get a yellowish tinge. So depending on the type of light you're putting on the scene, the colors you get will be different. And you need to correct for that, what is white? And then you have to demosaic and remove the color filter information and get the color values at every pixel, RGB, three values for every pixel. Then you transform to what is called unrendered color space. So some representation of color. And then depending on how you want to use the image, how you want to display the image, you transform to a rendered color space. So these are the steps that go through when you acquire an image with your camera, with your digital camera. A mosaic looks like this. It is a combination of red, green, and blue filters. Each little square here represents one CCD element in your two-dimensional camera detector array. And of course, this is much bigger if your camera has 16 megapixels, then you will have 16 million of these cells. 
in a certain arrangement of red, green, blue, like this. Now, this is called a mosaic. This is one type of a mosaic. So what this means is the pixel in the middle, mark number three, has a red filter. That pixel, the CCD element under that point will only give you the red component. These four corner pixels have blue and those pixels only get blue component. And these one, two, four, five pixels have a green filter and they only get green. But for every pixel you have to get RGB. So to get the green value for this pixel number three, you interpolate using pixels one, two, four, five. You calculate the horizontal gradient, delta H is G2 minus G4. You calculate the vertical gradients, G1 minus G5. If delta H is greater than delta V, then G3, the value of green for this pixel is G1 plus G5 divided by two. Otherwise, you ask another question, is delta H less than delta V? Then it is G2 plus G4. You average these two. Otherwise, you average all four. So green is given that way. Similarly, blue for this pixel is given by averaging these four pixels. So this process is called demosaicing, and you have to do this for every pixel. Or your camera does that. So when you acquire an image, this is done automatically. And then every pixel will have three values RGB. But there's only one sensor for every pixel. And there's only one value that is actually acquired really from the scene. The others are obtained by computing, by interpolation. So they're only estimated values, assuming a certain degree of smoothness. So you don't know the real blue value for this pixel. You are estimating it using those four. Similarly, you don't know the real green value you're estimating by averaging a combination of those four pixels that have the true green value. You need to calibrate the color. And for that, there are some standard calibration color checker. This is called the Macbeth color checker. Various colors are shown here, are printed using a standard process. And the RGB value for each of these squares is given. RGB values are given in a table. So you know the exact RGB values for each of these colors. Now you take a picture of that using your camera and your light, whatever light source you have. Depending on the light source you use, you get different colors. For the same chart, the Macbeth color chart, which is the same picture, if you use a xenon flash, you get this picture. With the same camera, if you use fluorescent light and the same color checker, you get this. And if you use sunlight, you get this. Obviously, the colors are very different. So when you want to buy clothing, especially saris, when you go to a shop, you don't want to check the color inside the shop because inside the shop, they have various types of lights. Maybe LED lights, maybe fluorescent lights, maybe incandescent, not anymore incandescent, but various types of light. So the color you see inside the shop will not be the true color. So typically, people who are very particular about color take the piece of cloth or the sari or the shirt outside in sunlight and look at that, and then that is assumed to be the true color. So when you use a different light source, you need a transformation to convert these colors to the true color. And for that, you take the RGB values in this patch and the true RGB values given by Macbeth, the company that made this, and compute the transformation and do that for all of these squares and then make up an average transformation and convert the data you acquire to the true color values. Now, there are two or three images that some people may not like. Some of you may be sensitive to images showing uh, wounds and lesions and medical images that are not uh, very pretty. But the next image shows burn wounds or scars. I shouldn't say scar, burn lesion. 
So if you don't like to see this, you could turn off your monitor or look somewhere else for a minute. So here, uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Archer and Dr. Serrano were working on teledermatology and they were interested in providing telemedicine service for burn wounds. So when a, pers when a patient or a person has uh, burn injury, the skin is burnt, proper treatment must be given immediately. And if this happens in some remote area or in a place where expert dermatologists are not available, then it's a bit difficult to assess the nature of the injury and the appropriate treatment. So then you may want to transmit an image of this digitally to some other place, a larger hospital, and get a proper diagnosis, but it has to be done quickly. The problem is when you acquire an image, the color that you get depends on the camera and the lighting used. Here, the blue color background is the cloth used on the examination table. Here, you have images taken of the same patient, the same arm, the same lesion, burn wound, with two cameras. A is using a Canon camera and B is using a, sorry, B here, using a Sony camera. The colors are different. The size is also different because the camera lens is different, but the color is different. Look at these colors. <coughs> Excuse me. They're different. After characterization, that is after transformation using this information, these colors are comparable. They're similar. So this is the true color, not that. So color characterization is an important step when uh, you want to send images where color is very important and determines the accuracy of the diagnosis and the determination of the appropriate treatment in this case. Well, that's a biomedical application, a simple one, but very important. Let's look at uh, filtering to remove noise. You know from general image processing with grayscale images that to filter an image, you may take a number of pixels surrounding the pixel being processed, like the pixel A. You take a three by three neighborhood, nine pixels, the current pixel and eight neighbors, and do something average, mean, median, something, and apply the result to the pixel A in the output image at the same location. And this for B and so on, for every pixel you do this. And the window is moved on the image and the pixels within the window are processed. So this is neighborhood filtering, moving average filtering, and different shapes are used for the neighborhood, three by three, five by five square. Uh, this is an approximate circle, the corner pixels are removed you could use a vertical bar or a horizontal bar. You can use an X shape and so on. Depending on the type of filtering you want, the type of smoothing you want, the type of artifacts you want to prevent, such as uh, blurring or clipping of corners, you would choose one of these and filter. Mean filter says take the average of all these values. So these are nine values. This is the central pixel and eight pixels around it. And your average, the mean is 90.67. But you may want to uh, round it off or to 91 or 90, because in a digital image, you cannot have this 0 0.67. But this is a new value, 90. Well, actually, there is 90 here. But if you go to 91, there is no 91 here. In median filtering, you rank order these values from the minimum 48 to the maximum 143. So 48, 72, 76, 83, and so on. And the median is the value in the middle. There are nine values, so the fifth value is the median that splits the distribution in half. The advantage of using the median is there's no blurring, and it is one of the values that is present here. And median filtering prevents blurring of edges, whereas mean filters will typically blur across sharp edges. But when you have a color image, for every pixel, you have three values, R, G, B. 
So this is the pixel in the middle, 244 for red, 77 green, 180 blue. And these are the eight pixels around it. Each one of them is a vector with three components. So how do you rank order them if you want to do median filtering? If you want to do mean filtering, there is no problem. Add all the red values, and that gives you the average red. All Add all the blue values, get the average blue. Get all the green values and average them, you get the average green. That's not a problem. But if you want to do median, you have to do rank ordering like this, but you cannot do that with three components. Marginal median says rank order red and then green and blue individually, separately, and take this in the middle, the fifth one. But this is not a color present in the original image. This is some arbitrary mix of so much red, so much green, so much blue, and it does not exist in this part of the image. So you'll be introducing a new color, which may not be valid in that image. So the marginal median sorting RGB separately is not a good idea. In reduced ordering, a scalar value is computed for each pixel. You compute the mean, the average of all the pixels, average of all the components, x i j, x red, x green, x blue, and add them and you get x bar. This is the mean of all these pixels. Mean of all the red is that, mean of all the green is this, mean of all the blue. Now compute the distance for each of these neighborhood pixels, each of these pixels, not from the center pixel, but from the mean and take that distance and rank order the pixels using that distance. The first one with the minimum distance is the closest to the mean and that is taken to be the median. And that pixel is 236, 114, 100, which is this. So you're selecting one of these eight pixels. You're not changing the value. So the color is faithful to the original. You're not introducing any arbitrary color in this process. But this is called reduced ordering and depending on which method you want to use, you can compute different types of distances. This is just Euclidean distance. You can also compute the sum of distances from each vector to all other vectors. You can compute this way or you can compute cosine inverse. The distance between xi and xk, two pixels, could be the Euclidean or could be the angle. Angle represents hue. So this is a difference in hue. So you may convert these vectors into some scalar value and then rank order using the scalar and pick one of them using some condition on that scalar value, which can be sorted without any problem. We have developed a method called adaptive neighborhood image processing, which we started with uh, grayscale images. And then in color, we can do it this way. This is a modified algorithm. This is a part of a color image, which I'll show you. This is a, a boundary or an edge in the image. This is the pixel that we are interested in. This is the original image, a part of the original image zoomed in. This is the image with noise. It's 30 by 30 pixels, part of the full image of 512 square pixels. When noise is added, this uh, sort of reddish brown becomes all these strange colors. The idea is to filter and go back to this original color as much as possible. So for this pixel, which is here, we grow a region by accumulating all pixels that have a certain distance less than a threshold from that pixel. So pixels that are similar to this value without crossing the edge. We don't want these pixels because they're very different. This is the edge. We want to remain on one side of the edge. So these 
pixels marked with white were selected. And then a few more pixels were included that were connected. And this was the region defined. So the region or the neighborhood that is used is of some arbitrary shape and size, depending on the statistics of the image and the noise. And then we compute the mean of this and put it in this pixel. And we do this for every pixel and then we get this from here. So the noisy image now becomes this, which is close to the original image, closer than the noisy version. And the edge is maintained. A little bit of blurring, but not much. And this is what happens when you have a full color image. This is the original image. This is the noisy image. I'm repeating the same here. And these eight images are different types of filter outputs. So this is using marginal median filtering. And this is using vector median filtering. And this is directional filtering and so on. And this is our method, adaptive neighborhood filtering. So we have shown using distance measures and various error measures that this is the best possible result as compared to all of the other available methods in the literature at that time. So when you are considering enhancement of color images, quite often the enhancement required would be only in the intensity component. You don't want to change hue. You don't want to change the primary color. You may want to change the saturation sometimes. You may want to increase the saturation to make the color brighter and stronger. But processing RGB separately is not usually recommended. Sometimes it may work, but sometimes the results could be really bad. To enhance images, we typically apply gamma correction and nonlinear transformation to intensity or to red, green, blue, or whichever component you want to modify. Or you do a histogram equalization. You compute the histogram, try to make it flat, as uniform as possible. So these are well-known techniques in grayscale image processing. I will not go into the details, but show you how to do of what happens in color images. So this is a picture I took, a mango tree. I was standing under the mango tree here. Uh, this is a restaurant in this large green grass and red tiles and green mangoes. But because I was standing under the tree, there was not much light here. So the mangoes appear almost black. And inside the house here or the restaurant, uh, there are some furniture items and people there, but you can't see. B is intensity only enhanced with gamma equal to 0 0.4. I did not change hue and saturation, only intensity. So now the color grass is green, not so dark. The mangoes are green. You can see the color variation in the leaves. You can see the color there. The sky is also a bit more colorful, brighter. And you can see all the colors you can see inside the building too. Here, I increased intensity and saturation with gamma equal to 0 0.4. So the blue is stronger, the green is stronger, but grass is not like this. This is too saturated. Grass is not pure green like that. It's almost fluorescent green. So this is not natural. So it's too much, saturation is too much. And here I enhanced RGB component separately using gamma equal to 0 0.4, the same gamma transformation, which is not bad, but I think this is better. It is subjective as to which one is the best of these images. I don't think any of you would choose this, but between these two, they are both uh, quite good. To enhance contrast in both luminance and color, there is a technique from the literature that defines contrast in luminance and color and then a transformation based upon an increased value of this contrast. Contrast is defined in this manner. You have a region which is called the object region or the foreground and you have a background surrounding it. Center versus surround or foreground versus background. 
One definition of contrast is PR minus PN divided by PN. The problem is if PN is zero, we have a problem here. And this is an open-ended number. Whereas this definition says PR minus PN divided by PR plus PN. So when the difference is zero, contrast is zero. And when any one of them is zero, the contrast is equal to one, or when either of them, PR or PN is zero. So this is a better definition that is in the range minus one to plus one, or if we take the absolute value from zero to one. The contrast in luminance is defined as the luminance value LMN minus the mean luminance divided by delta L max. CD, the color difference is defined in the LAD system, L star, A star, B star. This is the CIE standard, convert RGB to LAD. And when you compare two pixels or two values, LAB1 and LAB2, you take the Euclidean distance between the two, L1 minus L2 square, A1 minus A2 square, B1 minus B2 square, add them, take the square root. Color differences in the LAB or LUV spaces are said to be more closely related to color differences as perceived by the human visual system than differences, the same Euclidean difference compared, computed using RGB or HSI or other representations. So when you want to take color distances or differences, it is better to use the LAB or LUV system. And then this contrast is defined as CDM over CD max. That is this color difference divided by the maximum of that. So that is CC for every pixel MN. This is color contrast. This is luminance, brightness only contrast. Pixel value minus a local average divided by the maximum of that. And then the enhanced value, CEMN, the enhancement factor, is given by GLMN, CLMN, plus GCMN, CCMN. So CL, CC were obtained using these. And GL and GC are obtained using these methods. Delta CM minus delta C min divided by delta C minus max minus min, it's like a contrast. And GC, this is luminance, this is color. The same, delta C max minus delta C mn, divided by delta C max minus delta C min. Here, delta C mn is CL minus CC. That is the luminance and color information obtained from here. So these are gains for luminance and color. And then another value is obtained LE as LM plus CEMN delta L max. If LMN is greater than LM, the local mean, otherwise LM minus CE times delta L max. And then a gain factor KMN is given as LEMN divided by LMN. LMN is from the previous step here. Uh, LMN is the local uh, pixel brightness. So LEMN, so this is a ratio. And this ratio, this gain factor is applied to the red value and the green and the blue separately. The same factor, KMN, for each component. So you're not changing the color proportion. Same gain, KMN, to red and also green and blue. So this method was published by Liu and Yan, and it works very well. This is a picture I took in Japan, a pagoda. I was standing under the pagoda and took a picture against the sky. And you can't see the details under these, uh, I don't know what to call them, these parts of the pagoda. This is a representation of luminance contrast. Wherever the difference in luminance is large, the value is large. This is color contrast, but well, they are different. And this is the enhanced image. Now you can see a little bit of blue in the sky. It's hard to see there. You can see all the color, the red and green and yellow here under these parts of the pagoda that you cannot see there. So here, contrast has been enhanced in luminance and color. 
And I tried it with a few other images. It worked really well. Color histogram equalization. There are quite a few techniques proposed in the literature. This is the original image. This is applying histogram equalization to RGB separately. Now you see the problem. You see purple, you see blue here on the mountain. Mountain doesn't have any blue. That color is artificial. It's an artifact created by histogram equalization, all this purple color, they don't exist. C is um, what is called 3D histogram equalization. These methods are described in the book. There are also, there are also papers in the literature. If you look at uh, this histogram equalization paper by my colleagues and uh, myself, you will see the details. This is uh, the result of um, histogram decimation. You see all these colors that are not true, purple and magenta. And even here, strange colors using what is called histogram explosion. This is using our technique of adaptive neighborhood histogram equalization. For every pixel, you compute a local neighborhood that is adaptive. And using the statistics of that, you modify only the intensity and keep the color information the same. So if you compare the two, there is improvement in contrast. And we have shown some details in the paper, uh, Buzuloi and others. And I won't go into the details anymore. We don't have much time left now. Segmentation is another important image processing application. And in grayscale images, you could specify a range of grayscale and say, give me all the pixels between the values of uh, 120 and 140. I don't know what it means, but it depends upon the application. And then you may also want to say, give me pixels that are connected and have values in this range. That is, they must all be spatially connected. In the case of color images, if you use RGB, you can say, give me all pixels that have red between these two values, green between these two values, and blue between these two values. And that will be a box in the RGB cube but it's very difficult to specify these ranges. But if you use the, use the HSI representation, this is hue, angle, saturation going out, intensity is not shown here. Well, you see the colors, you see all the colors here. If you want yellow, you can say, well, I can put a limit uh, between 50 and 70 degrees. Or I can make it smaller. I can say, give me hue values that are between 60 degrees and 70 degrees. And if the saturation is less than some limit, 0.4, let's say, I don't care. It is not yellow. Maybe only this much. So I can specify. I know. I can see what the colors are. And I can specify a range. And... That's what I have done here using this image. I said, give me all red values in the range of plus minus 30 degrees of hue and saturation more than 0.1 or some limit. So these are all the red, green. Yellow, I gave a very large range. It included light green between green and yellow. So I could have made it smaller, but I kept all of these as 60 degree ranges just for comparison. So I get only green, I get only cyan, and so on. And these are all the non-chromatic pixels. Black. The next image is not a pretty image. It's a illusion due to uh, <clears throat> what is called Venus insufficiency. Diabetes causes various problems and blood pressure variations also cause various circulation problems. And if veins become weak, the valves within the veins don't work well and blood tends to pool in the extremities, especially in the legs. And when blood pools, there could be some lesions when parts of the circulatory system uh, rupture. So the next image is not a nice image. If you don't want to look at it, uh, you could shut down your monitor or look somewhere else. 
this patient has a lesion on the foot and we worked it with dermatologists in the university of sao paulo in brazil on this when taking this picture this color band was applied the color shows this band shows various shades of red and green and blue and also some black and white that's the skin of the patient the natural color a sort of brown in the lesion the skin also the red part is what is called granulation the green part is what is called fibrin and the black part is what is called necrosis and we attempted to separate them for red we said saturation must be greater than 0.4 and hue must be between 300 degrees to 0 to 30 degrees we gave a large range on the lower side It doesn't go to 300 that will be magenta but still that's what we did and we get these pixels some normal skin is also coming here because saturation is uh, a little we could have changed the saturation limit here you see the red patch here it's also picked up the red patches here are picked up so that is an approximation of the red granulation tissue yellow you see the yellow patch here has been segmented saturation i put a limit of 0.2 few 30 to 90 degrees 90 degrees is not really yellow it's almost green but still there could be some green tinge here black saturation less than 2 0.2 and intensity less than 0.25 max and put these together you get the ulcer regions so when you have a distribution of uh, granulation versus fibrin versus necrosis that helps in analyzing the state of the ulcer as treatment progresses the fibrin and necrotic scar should uh, reduce and red should increase and eventually natural normal skin should develop so the relative proportion of these three components is important in the analysis of the state of the ulcer and response to treatment and we provided this quantitative information to dermatologists to help them in the analysis of a given ulcer image and the response to treatment segmentation can also be done using what is called the k means algorithm you have a set of pixels x1 x2 so on xn all the pixels in the image i'll finish in 5 minutes each of these pixels is a three dimensional vector you make a code book of vector vectors that are centroids of regions colors k of them let's say they could be arbitrary to begin with and assign pixels to each one of these sets pi here is a set the ith set includes uh, all pixels that have that minimum have distance from j i'm sorry let's sir, please this. continue sir yeah, please continue let me finish this yes, and sir. then i'll take questions so that uh, yes, uh, yes we don't disturb those who want to leave yes, yes. so this is you assign the uh, pixels to one of these sets such that the pixel is closest to one of these vectors the centroids so pick pixels that are closest to each of these centroids and assign them to that set so that is a segmentation algorithm but to bring it with the centroids are arbitrary and then you compute an error x minus vi some sort of a deviation and then you say uh take that and apply a new centroid compute a new centroid by averaging all those pixels and then you want to minimize this the spread of each of these sets each of these uh groups that you are creating so this after some iteration will give you groups of pixels that belong to a certain number of clusters it's clustering so you have to specify how many clusters you want so here is a color image but this requires distances you need to compare x minus vi here also x minus vj 
So when you take differences, the question arises, which color system do you want to use? And as I mentioned earlier, the LAB system gives the best uh, distance that agrees the best with the human visual perception of color difference as compared to sRGB and hue saturation value. So this is the original image. And if you apply the same clustering algorithm using sRGB, you get these clusters. Each one of these uniform regions is a cluster. And the color is the average color of the pixels belonging to the cluster. As you can see, this color is not this yellow. So this segmentation is not very good. And this red is not the same as that red or orange, it's different. This is using HSV and this cluster has an average of this pink and all these pixels with the same pink value are given the same cluster, which is not true. Using LAB, you get these clusters. These, this color is closer to this yellow than the others. And here you see there is some white region, as in the original, and pink region. And these colors and segmentation regions are closer to the original than the others. So this is segmentation using LAB, which in this case is the best result that we could get. And here with the PEPPERS image too, using sRGB, HSV, which is similar to HSI, but instead of intensity, the value is defined using a different formula. And this is using LAB. And this result is the best if you compare all these minor details. The last example I wanna show is color deconvolution in histopathology images. As I mentioned, in histopathology, multiple dyes or stains are applied to a biological specimen from biopsy or autopsy. Three commonly used stains are hematoxylin, eosin, and DAB. When three stains are applied, you get some combination of these three stains for every pixel. You get some colors. And you may want to separate them and ask the question, how much of hematoxylin do I have at each pixel and how much of eosin, how much of DAB? To do that, you have to deconvolve. These are standard stains, so we know the RGB values for each color. Hematoxylin has this RGB combination. Eosin has this, DAB has this, these are standard. So the matrix P is made up of three RGB values for the three stains. A normalized value is computed for each value, each pixel or each element of this matrix. I shouldn't say pixel, each element of the matrix. Mij is Pij divided by the square root of the sum of the squares of all the values, Pij, three by three of them. So it's a normalized one. So this matrix is called M. Then the color pixel RGB vector at each pixel in the image, it's a one by three. Y is CM. M is the normalized matrix and C is the combination of these three stains at that pixel. So three by three, three by three, this is, so this is three by three, one by three, one by three. This is the stained histopathology image that has all three stains. So you have uh, pink here, you have the blue here, you have the brown here. But after deconvolution, using this formula, C is Y M inverse. So you have to find the inverse of this matrix M, which is the normalized P matrix. And then you get C as Y M inverse. Uh, y is the original pixel value for each pixel you get a C value. So then here in B, you have the hematoxylin, the blue, and here you have the eosin magenta in C, and here you have the brown, which is the DAB. When you add these three, you get the original. So now you know the relative contribution of each of these stains at every pixel. So this is an interesting example by Rui Prock and others. 
of separation of colors in a color image. Uh, you may be able to apply this to other types of images too, but then you need to know what these components are and how they were added together. So these are just some examples and some topics to give you an introduction to color image processing and uh, an idea as to how we may apply some of these techniques to a few fun examples just to play around and a few serious examples with applications in biomedical engineering, in histopathology, in telemedicine, and uh, in dermatology. I showed three biomedical examples. There are more, of course, but given this time, that's what I can show you. And then there are many more techniques. Some of them are described in our book and some in other books on color image processing, edge detection, region growing, morphological image processing, hyperspectral image processing, analysis of texture, coding and data compression, burn wounds, skin ulcers, I showed you, teledermatology, telepathology, hyperspectral aerial photogrammetry with uh, LIDAR. This is where for every pixel you may have a hundred or a thousand components. The electromagnetic band is broken not into three bands for RGB, but many small bands of maybe 10 nanometers width. So each pixel has a thousand values, which is hyperspectral photogrammetry. So these are a few other topics. I hope uh, if you're interested in some of these, you can find more material to read and learn and apply these techniques to new and interesting problems with practical applications. There are some of uh, these methods and a few more described in our book, but uh, there are many other sources available now. And I thank you for your attention. I thank uh, Dr. Sapate and Dr. Bandari and the conference organizers for inviting me. I hope uh, this presentation is useful in your work. Uh, I'm a little over time, but if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I request all the participants, uh, those who have got question in their minds, can uh, please ask. Yes. Sir, I'm having one question. Yeah. Yeah, so you talked about histopathological images and in one slide you said that C is being computed as Y M inverse. So uh, what is Y actually it is a RGB vector, actual original RGB vector? Correct. Correct. Y is the RGB vector at one pixel. Yes, correct. Right. Okay. And then... <laughs> Uh, M is the mixing matrix that you are inverting. Yes, yes, yes. That so I got. Only yeah. I had the confusion with uh, Y. It is done pixel by pixel, not for the entire page at one shot. You cannot do that. Uh, yes. Well, you could, you, here it is done one pixel at a time you obtain the three components. The input will have three components RGB. The output will have three components, which are the mix of the three stains. Yes, right. And uh, sir, I have one more question, whether for histopathological images, uh, the RGB images are being used or some other color model? Well, it depends. Um, typically what you acquire will be RGB. The yes. camera, a scanner will give you RGB values. Depending on what you want to do, you will need to convert RGB to something else. Correct. Could be LAB, could be LUV, could be HSI. If you want to compute differences, pixel X minus pixel Y, then LAB, LUV would be better than the others. And then of course, whatever you do, you, you have to come back to RGB because you want to display the image. Right or you want to display if it is only a region, you can draw a contour. But if you're doing enhancement or some color representation, you have to come back to RGB. Right, right. Yeah, so in so between, you, times, may, you, may, yes. yeah, you may start with RGB and in between, you may use multiple other representations. In some of our projects, we use 
LAB to compute distances or differences. And then we use HSI for segmentation. And then we use uh, HSI also for enhancement to enhance only intensity. Yes. And then to come back to display, we have to come back to RGB. Yes, correct. So many times it happens, uh, there is a confusion in the mind of researchers that which kind of color model to be used for what kind of application. So that is why yes. I asked that general question. So yeah, yeah it's uh, not the application. Yeah. It's not the application in terms of dermatology or pathology, but it is kind of what you images. Are, what you are computing, the operation you are performing within the application, that is yes. important. So for yes. each operation, segmentation, enhancement, uh, color difference, color matching, uh, you, you may want to use different representations. So within one program for one application, one medical or some application, you may use multiple representations of color for different steps of the process. Yes, thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. Sir, yeah, I have is. a small query. Yeah, yeah, I have a small query here. Sir, please go ahead. And this the query relates with the color edge detection. Usually, when we focus on the edge detection part of it, we are more concerned with whether there is an edge component or otherwise. But when we look for a color, uh, color could be the many combinations of this RGB. We are looking for a point in a color belonging to an edge point. And accordingly, we can collect all those points and we can create edge of it. But there could be many such edges. So when we look basically for the color edge detection as such, what is being the main focus of it? Well, edges are typically detected using difference measures. So you're comparing pixels in a certain neighborhood. And if the difference is large, you could suspect that there is an edge present. You're comparing neighboring pixels. With color, it could so happen that there could be large differences in color. One pixel could be green. The next pixel could be red. It doesn't happen in, in real life images. But theoretically, it is possible that one pixel is completely green only. The next one is completely red only. The next one is only blue, but all with equal intensity. So comparing only intensity will not help you detect such changes or edges. So you need to take into account color. And color differences may not be so drastic. That is, one is red, the other is blue. But some small shades will differ, or color will differ in small shades. So now you have to take a color vectorial distance. So what kind of a distance do you want? Would you like Euclidean distance? Would you like angular distance, uh, like the vector angle, angle between two vectors? The difficulty with RGB is you are in the three-dimensional space. If you go to HSI, intensity is separate. It has no color information. Only HS, hue and saturation have color information. So it's a two-dimensional plane. So the vector uh, vectors, the color vector is now only two dimensional. So now you can get the angle between the color vectors, which is difference in hue. So that may be a better measure to compute differences and hence detect edges in hue, disregarding intensity. We don't care about intensity. It's only color. But if you want all of them to be put together, then Euclidean distance of the three-dimensional vector would be the best, but RGB would not be most likely the best option. And instead, you may want to go to LAB or LUV for three-dimensional color differences or distances. So edge detection depends upon gradients and gradients depend upon differences and distances. So edge detection comes down to the question of computing color difference. And that is where we need to look into whether we want two color components or three. 
we want to deal with two dimensional vectors, go to HSI, only hue and saturation for color. You want three, then go to LAB, LUV. Does that answer your question or did I not get it? Sir, it's a very, very, very good answering to the question. And Thank I you. got insight into it to take it forward. Definitely, sir, we'll go forward. Good, good idea, sir. Thank good. you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other uh, participant want to ask any question? Please. <laughs> And by the way, a PDF file of this is available on my website. So if you put in Rangayan and go to my website, you can download a PDF file of uh, this seminar and a few others too. Uh, yes, sir. Patil, sir. No, I think uh, we should conclude. Thank you, sir. Thanks, You're very sir. welcome. Thank you okay. and uh, namaste. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So uh, let us conclude the session on behalf of uh, Anna Sahib Dange College of Engineering and Technology and on behalf of the organizing committee of this conference. I thank uh, you, Rangayan sir. Thank you for sparing your valuable time with us. Thank you for sharing with your experience with us. Definitely the researchers, participants and the faculty members of this conference will get many insights so that they can apply these all techniques that you explained today for their research and related activities. Thank you, sir, once again. And You're welcome. Uh, have a nice my, day. My sir. pleasure. Uh, one more thing, sir. Uh, sir. Uh, we'll see how it can be taken ahead jointly with you and our organization along with uh, under the guidance of P.J. Kulkarni, sir, we we'll definitely do some collaborative activity and uh, see to it that the knowledge which you have, how it can be shared with our people, how they can use it and how it can be implemented for the benefit of the society. Sure. Over the past few Thank years, you, I have given several courses under the Gyan program of the central government. Uh, I have given courses on biomedical signal processing and biomedical image processing. If uh, resources are available, I shall be glad to come and give a course. Definitely. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, uh, sir, uh, there may be some students uh, who may interact with you. So, officially, I declare that session is over. But, uh, okay. sir, I request you to please uh, be with us for another five minutes so that anybody else want uh, can interact with you. Sure, sure. Uh, Dr. Talbar, Hello, sir. Sir. Uh, sir, I hope... Uh, ah. Welcome, sir. Hello. Ah, hello. Ah, hello, sir. Yes, sir, please continue. Uh, yeah, yeah. How are you, sir? Doing well, thank you. Could you please turn your video on? I can't see. Okay, 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 okay. I can't okay. see who's talking here. Uh, sir, I hope uh, you remember, yeah. Talbar sir is my supervisor, PhD supervisor. We so had hello, yes, sir. sessions at SGGS Nanded, sir. Yes, yes, thank you, yeah. Yes, sir, he is there. How are you doing, sir? Thank Hello, sir. I, I, I'm a bit busy with, I'm traveling, actually, because of which I could not join your lecture. Ah, okay, okay. No problem. How are you, I'm, sir? I'm doing very well. Thank you. It was a, a very nice conference uh, we had in Nanded. Uh, some correct, 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 correct. Five correct, years correct. ago, six years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. Six, six, six years, 2016. October yeah. 2016. Uh, we also enjoyed. Uh, uh, now, yeah, where you are placed? In Calgary or uh, nearby? No, I'm in Calgary, the same place. Okay. Okay. I okay. retired from okay. the okay. University okay. of Calgary five years ago. Ah, yes, that 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 I know, but later I could not uh, keep the track with you. Yeah, in the, the past few years I have come to India a few times to give uh, 
gyan courses you know after the conference in nanded i went to warangal in fact uh, suhas took me to warangal and uh-huh. then the next uh-huh. the year after that i gave two courses at uh, triple it in alhabad or prayag and okay. uh, iit okay. roorkee okay. okay okay so i've been doing that and uh, giving a few lectures at a few places after retirement Very and good. Uh, doing some consulting work so Very i'll be good. glad to come and give lectures when resources yeah, are yeah. available we will and, tra- arrange something. and travel is uh, not so difficult i am also getting retired uh, in june uh-huh. from nanded i see so later we will we will discuss in detail and we will plan some uh, lectures sure sure isn't it eh? yes we can certainly do yeah. that i'll be glad to I, do that yes 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 i hope you are doing well thank you very and much for attending this uh, or uh, joining uh, for this conference you're eh? welcome It's my pleasure uh, okay okay sir fine thank you thank you okay. bye thank you yes sir. so us thank you ha uh, ah, yes sir. i uh, I, I i i hand over to you okay okay sir thank you sir huh thank you sir fine 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 okay yeah any, anybody else who want to interact with uh, dr rangraj rangain sir uh, the forum official unofficial is open rest all members uh, i officially have already declared that the session is over and can leave the meeting those who want to interact with sir can stay with us uh so has you don't you have yes, another sir. session now don't you have another yes, session yes sir yes sir we already parallelly we have started the session on uh, uh, other link sir okay okay there is another link we have started there are different coordinators sir okay. we have started all right all right yeah, i just wanted you to stay for a couple of minutes so that our sure. other members can interact with you sure. because this is a very wonderful opportunity for all other participants as well certainly yeah just for a couple of minutes no problem a uh, professor ranga uh, yes. i have a small appeal to you uh, based on your vast experience and uh, way that you elaborated all the details regarding this color digital image processing if you feel that there are some of the topics that engineering students can undertake for their project or for a pg student for their research can you highlight those so that this ahta college people whereupon they are more interested to take a deep dive into the research will find some appropriate inputs from your end so if you are in a position to cite out few of such titles wherein these students or the faculty member can take their contribution to take that research forward it would be very nice i'll try to do that in in our book at the end of each chapter we have suggested a few areas for further investigation okay, okay. Uh, the the book i mentioned is published by spie and uh, it is available in digital format uh, may perhaps your digital okay. library has a subscription to spie uh, so we have mentioned but the book is a little old already uh, the the best uh, option to scout for current issues and problems is to attend some of these conferences now it's becoming more and more difficult with the covid or corona uh, hopefully next year things will be better uh, that's where typically we can come across current issues and topics and problems if it is biomedical i stress the importance of collaboration with local hospitals and medical specialists to understand what their issues and problems are and what kinds of solutions they would like in their practice but in general color image processing um as i said we have mentioned a few topics in our book but the best place would be to attend like a like triple image processing conference or a you know, conference on color image processing but when if we are able to meet personally then we can have a di- discussion session and then more ideas will come up 
it's a little difficult for me to make a list myself uh, to say, okay, these are current topics of interest. It cannot be done in isolation. So my preference would be to sit with the interested parties and have a discussion. And then perhaps some, the discussions will lead to problems of interest and research topics will evolve out of that. But I will try. I will try to uh, Very good, sir. That's identify very current good. issues. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a great point, sir. The organizers will definitely make it a point. We'll set up a link and we can uh, conveniently join the link for carrying out further interaction. We'll definitely have an interaction and I believe that we, with your inputs, the faculty as well as the students will take up a deep dive, taking this research uh, for a different, better height further. We'll definitely look into it, sir. We'll have a better sure. interactions. We'll set up a separate link for that. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Yeah, anybody else? Uh, last uh, chance to interact with, sir. Yeah, Shinde, madam. Okay. Uh, it seems now all <laughs> are happy with uh, this session. That's I okay. hope uh, this was a great interaction with you, sir. And uh, Hopefully, we'll continue uh, this kind of uh, interactions. There are many sure. uh, other institutes uh, nearby us also. And mm -hmm. of course, as our Honorable Director, uh, Sir, told, we'll continue the interactions with you, Sir. We'll see that a uh, group of faculty members from our institute uh, will uh, be in touch with you so that they can take ahead their research, their topics, and get uh, guidance from you, Sir. I'll so try to do that. Uh, sure. Yes, sir. hopefully we'll be in touch and uh, I will let you know the schedule and the way we can go ahead, sir. Sure. Thank and uh, Dr. P.J. Kulkarni, sir, is uh, you know our mentor for last uh, almost 30 years and we are very fortunate that uh, he's always with us, he's always there to guide us. Of course, our director, sir, uh, is also there, Dr. Vikram Patil, sir. So, I... Uh, officially now declare that this session is uh, over. Once again, I'm very thankful to Dr. P.J. Kulkarni, sir, for joining us, Dr. Esin Talbar, sir, and uh, our director, Dr. Vikram Patil, sir, for uh, sparing their valuable time with us for this wonderful session. Once again, on behalf of all the participants in this uh, meeting, I thank you, Dr. Rangayan, sir. Thank you very much and have a nice day, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Wish you a successful conference. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Namaste, sir. So I request all to uh, leave the meeting. All can leave the meeting and can join the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much.